Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In order to better understand the microwave background, our analysis of water now continues. We have just released these two videos on the subject and if you have not watched them, you need to have a look. It is well known that liquid water is transparent in the optical, but it is opaque in the microwave and far infrared as we saw in this figure within the second video on water. If you doubt the argument, have a look at the movie Crimson Tide. In this movie, you have a submarine which is desperately trying to confirm a nuclear launch order. But because they are submerged, their communication is dead to microwaves. In fact, I have been told long ago by someone who served on a submarine that as soon as the microwave antenna falls below the surface of the water, even by an inch, microwave communications are dead in the submarine. This affirms that liquid water is indeed a very powerful absorber of microwaves as we also know from using our kitchen microwaves. Now we need to try to understand what is happening in water both in the optical and in the microwave. You recall that in the first video on water, the structure of ice 1H was presented and we now turn to that structure once again. Ice 1H has a hexagonal structure. But unlike graphite, where the atoms which make up the hexagon are all in one plane, in water the oxygen atoms are somewhat puckered away from the plane. The question is, how does this puckering affect the absorption and emission of water? Obviously, water is transparent in the optical range, whereas graphite is opaque. Now why is that? Well, first, we have to look at the structure of graphite and consider the hybridization of each carbon atom. You recall that in this video I demonstrated that the carbon atoms in graphite are sp2 hybridized. Each carbon atom has four outer shell electrons. Three of these enter the sp2 hybridized orbitals and make a sigma bond with other carbon atoms in the lattice. The remaining outer shell electron stays in an unhybridized p orbital. That electron is able to become delocalized and can be used to make pi bonds within the lattice. The carbon-carbon bond length in graphite is about 1.42 angstroms, which is only slightly larger than that of a normal carbon-carbon double bond. It is the presence of these pi bonding electrons which enables graphite to strongly absorb in the optical. The sigma bonds are not able to absorb in that region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Unlike graphite, water only has sigma bonds. It has no pi bonding electrons because the hydrogen atoms which are interspaced between the oxygens make the distances too large. The hydroxyl bond length in water is about 0.97 angstroms and the hydrogen bond is about 1.97 angstroms. So the distance between oxygen atoms within each oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen subunit of the hexagon will now be on the order of about three angstrom if one assumes a linear configuration, which is not quite true due to hydrogen bond libration. Now that distance is much larger than the 1.42 angstroms in graphite. The oxygen atoms in water possess six outer shell electrons and are sp3 hybridized. Two single electrons occupy two of these hybridized orbitals. These two electrons each make a sigma bond to a hydrogen atom. The remaining four outer shell electrons of oxygen are placed in pairs within the remaining two sp3 hybridized orbitals. In water, the unbonded electron pairs pretty much reside near the respective oxygen atoms, at least as far as absorption in the optical at one atmosphere is concerned. But if you examine the structure closely, you will notice something quite interesting about water, and that is that each hydrogen atom is actually interacting with a total of four electrons. Two come from the hydroxyl bond, and two more from the hydrogen bond. As a result of all this, and unlike graphite, one does not obtain significant electron delocalization in water because the interatomic distances between the oxygen atoms are too great. Thus, under normal circumstances, water is transparent in the optical. However, that is not to say that there is no electron delocalization at all. In fact, there is increasing evidence for electron delocalization within the hydrogen bond, as one can learn here. It is known that delocalization increases as the structure of small water clusters becomes more planar, as demonstrated in this paper. In the end, electron pairs from the sp3 hybridized oxygen in one molecule are being delocalized into the hydrogen bond and interacting with the anti-bonding orbital of the hydrogen atom, as discussed in this review. This delocalization is important when we consider microwave and far-infrared emission and absorption. 
One can gain more insight into this problem if one considers what happens when water molecules are compressed and the bonds made shorter. In water, the separation between adjacent oxygen atoms with an intervening hydrogen atom is actually about 2.7 angstroms, as one can learn here. That is because libration carries the hydrogen atom away from the inter-oxygen axis, so we do not have a 3 angstrom oxygen-oxygen distance. In any case, with pressure, the oxygen-oxygen distance can be greatly shortened to less than 2.3 angstroms, as one can learn in the last paper. In fact, Chen et al. use ab initio calculations to predict that in water, there is actually a significant oxygen-to-oxygen -oxygen interaction across the hydrogen bond. When water is compressed, this oxygen-oxygen interaction is thought to increase rapidly. As a result, the free electrons in the sp3 hybridized shell of water are likely to become more delocalized upon compression, and now one can get absorption in the optical. In this regard, it is interesting to note that while water is transparent in the optical at shock pressures up to 30 gigapascals, as one can learn in this paper, it actually becomes opaque and optically black if shock compressed to higher values. Here are the relevant quotations. Temperatures from 3300 to 5200 Kelvin were measured in liquid water shocked to 50 to 80 gigapascals. Thus, within the accuracy of the data, shocked water in the pressure range of 50 to 80 gigapascals radiates as a black body, epsilon equals 1. This is simply amazing. On powerful compression, water can reach an emissivity of 1. It becomes a perfect black body in the optical. Think about it. Water has the ability to act as a black body when it is shock compressed. That should give plenty of opportunity for pause by the cosmologist. If water can become a black body in the optical when it is shock compressed, what prevents it from acting as a black body in the microwave and far infrared when it is not shock compressed? The answer, of course, is nothing. One would expect that when it is not shock compressed, water has a proper structure to act as a black body at those frequencies. After all, in shock compression, the water lattice does not have time to rearrange. The bond lengths simply shorten. This is not at all like imposing a constant pressure on water, where there could be time for atomic rearrangement and for water to adopt a different lattice structure. To make the point clear, one simply has to consider what happens to water when it is shock compressed as a result of an underwater nuclear explosion. Here is a quote from the Department of Defense relative to water becoming optically black during a nuclear test. In the course of its rapid expansion, the hot gas bubble, while still underwater, initiates a shock wave. Intersection of the shock wave with the surface produces an effect which, when viewed from above, appears to be a rapidly expanding ring of darkened water. This is often called the slick because of its resemblance to an oil slick. Next, we will watch two videos of the Baker nuclear test on Bikini Atoll. For this test, the bomb was suspended 90 feet below the surface. Upon detonation, the surface became optically black. The videos are played first at regular speed and then slowed down to one tenth speed such that the slick formation can be better visualized. That slick results from the shock compression of water. We know that the water was being compressed because the slick formation was immediately followed by a crack, wherein the surface became white. Cracking occurs because water, quickly compressed, now relaxes back due to negative pressure having been created behind the wavefront. The resulting crack is a sure sign that the water lattice has been compressed and when it happened, it had become optically black. The video is paused at the end such that one can better visualize the slick. In the next video, the same test is presented, but this time from the shoreline. As a result of both laboratory tests involving the shock compression of water and of underwater nuclear explosions, it is clear that water can behave as a black body in the optical under these conditions. This tells us something fundamental about the lattice structure of water. Remember that even when water is not shock compressed, there is still slight oxygen to oxygen interaction. This has a strength on the order of the strength of the hydrogen bond as one can learn in the paper by Chen et al. 
It is likely that this oxygen to oxygen interaction provides a small amount of delocalization necessary to emit microwave and far infrared radiation when water is not shock compressed. Finally, in this video, I had described the work of Professor Jerry Polak at the University of Washington. To recap, Jerry has argued that water can assume a truly hexagonal planar structure at interfaces with materials, including at its surface. The work is described in his text, and he refers to the structure as easy water, where EZ stands for exclusion zone. He has demonstrated that at the exclusion zone, we have a negative charge, and the adjacent bulk water becomes slightly positive. As an update today, the structure of easy water has been recently questioned in this paper. However, in my view, Dr. Pollock's structure makes the most sense, not only because it easily accounts for the emissive properties of water at the surface, but also because the hexagonal planes of water would act much like the planes of graphite, which could remove contaminates and send them into the intercalate regions. A truly planar structure for easy water may well provide additional ability for water to emit as a black body in the microwave and far infrared, but more studies are needed in this area. Well, that is all for now. We return to water in the next video, where we will discuss the microwave emission of the oceans and the continents. That will complete our discussion of water. If you enjoyed the video today, Promote the channel, mention the video to your local astronomy club and to your friends, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.